I'm going to open it up to uh, the audience and uh, go ahead. Hi, Jake Berger, the Energy Council of Canada. The, uh, in terms of the regulatory approach, I mean, it seems to me a difficulty persists, is that there's one kind of yes and two kinds of no. Uh, the one kind of yes is when you go through the regulatory process and the government says yes and supports the project through political cycles and um, defends it and sees it through to complete. That's one kind of yes. You could also go through that process and be told a straight no at the end. That's one kind of no. The other kind of no that I think worries us mostly is the one where there's it's just sort of interminably goes on and then dies from a thousand cuts. And I think that's a lot of the angst that you hear when everybody talks about regulatory process, particularly is that second kind of no, um, the one that's not explicit, but that, that occurs nonetheless. And then perhaps the, the other thing I wanted to mention about um, C69, and this is a paradox that maybe, I don't know, you can talk about, is this idea that at the end of the process that the minister can, kill, can still come in. And that one, I think it's a, it's a paradox because I think both sides equally and oppositely support the idea. And the idea is that if you're opposing a project and you go through a big, huge, long regulatory process and the project wins, you still don't like it, well, maybe the minister will come in and yank the carpet on your behalf. And if you're a proponent, you go through the big uh, project and you get a no at the end, well, maybe the minister will come in and yank the carpet on your behalf. But either way, you've gone through a huge, major, long process to get to, you know, final arbitrary answer at the end. Um, how do we deal with that? Because to me, it just sounds like just more uncertainty and the second kind of no persisting perhaps even more strongly than before. Yeah, I think well, this, this is not clear with the C69. I'm not a, I'm not a, a specialist uh, about, uh, you know, uh, legal issues and all, all this stuff, but uh, um, it, we can see that it's, it's a partial revision. Restore the regulators pre-2012 decision making authority on whether or not issues issue a certificate for major projects subject to cabinet approval. So in some situation, uh, if I understand well, uh, the, the, pol the politician can still uh, uh, influence or decide and on other decision, and on other decision, uh, he, he cannot, he cannot. So I don't know, Mike, if you... Uh, okay. Because we don't even know which projects the process will apply to. So there's a lot of questions about it, but the, the, the question that was raised is exactly the issue that we were asking the government to deal with. When I say we, I mean Enbridge, yes, but also m much of industry was asking for some clarity earlier in the process as to whether what was being proposed fit within the national policy framework and therefore had some likelihood or some possibility of being uh, seen as being in the national interest. Before we kind of went through all of the whole exercise of engineering and scoping and, uh, and everything else that needs to happen, which takes a lot of time and a big investment, that was not, uh, that was not incorporated into, into what's been proposed. We're continuing to talk to the government about is there a way to include in the early planning phase that they've identified uh, potentially some of those issues, maybe, maybe, maybe give a little bit of guidance through that, but, but so far that's not been the case. And, uh, you know, having, being with a company that has had that experience where we went through a long process, went through the pre-2012 process, uh, received a certificate, uh, then through a, through a litigation, the court said that the government had failed to, in their duty to consult with indigenous people, and uh, the government refused to go back and, and do a proper job of consultation, made some policy changes to implement a tanker ban, uh, and, uh, and then refused our project after 10 years and $700 million, and having been approved by one government, and that, so, uh, you know, I mean, it's a it's an example of what can happen, and why some better certainty and predictability 
to how the regulatory process will unfold was being uh, was being asked for. And just quickly, I know, I know this chap has a, a question. <coughs> um, I think in most projects, there's an assumption of a long no. It's just a question of whose no it's going to be. Um, we also, it's, it's, I don't know how you address it, but in our projects, um, we also, you know, to, to uh, Roxanne's point, we build in an assumption of, we haven't really talked about court challenges, um, we build in an assumption of a certain level of court challenge into our project planning now, <coughs> that, uh, and certain budget items, that, that this is inevitable, <coughs> that even if you get an acceptable uh, approval from whatever regulatory authority, someone's going to challenge you and you're going to spend the next two years at federal court, next level of court. So it's just, it's just the way the system has become. And certainly, uh, you know, there's part of the policy regulatory nexus that I discuss is the concern for uh, policymakers being able to override regulatory decisions. So there's, there's a, a lot of scholarly literature out there, there that says uh, regulatory independence really needs to be um, addressed. Um, I've gotten the message that we are well out of time, and I apologize. I, I know you've been waiting patiently, but I, I have to hold off at this moment so we can stay on schedule. So I'd like everybody to uh, please give a round of applause for our, our panelists, um, and clearly there's lots of work to do.